Cinema Jaws is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. Listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is Ry the Movie Guy. And sitting inside the fish tank is none other than Phil Me and Phil. How's it going, guys? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we take a trip around the circle of life. Nice. As we cover our top five favorite movie kings. I like it, Ryan. Does that mean you're going to get eaten by a lion and then he's going to poop and you're going to be the grass, the circle of life? That could happen. I hope so. (laughs) I kind of would like to see that. I'd come back as grass. That's what you would expect. Well, you you know, we're all in the stars, Ryan. Mm. You know, I think you'd come back as a a jackass. Yeah, or a dung beetle or something. Mm. Yes. Um, We are doing our (laughs) top five. I'm joking. We are doing our top five movie kings in honor of... I think the Jawheads get it already. Uh, a review here that we have of The Lion King coming up. Right. The the remake, we should say. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Not going, the classic. Going to be fun. Helping us with that list is a returning guest, Matt K. Yes, yes. Jeff York is back. He is a film critic with The Establishing Shot, as well as a well-known artist. He's, his art has appeared in Playboy, a number of other periodicals, The New Yorker. We'll get to talk to Jeff. Not to mention his art has appeared on Cinema Jaws Instagram quite a lot lately. Quite liberally, and yeah. we'll, we'll ask him how he feels about that. Okay. Because uh, it's something to see. And I think we're using his art in a, in a good way. I hope so. I hope we're doing it justice. I, I think hope maybe so we are. Yes. Besides that, we have more going on this week. Don't we, Phil? Oh, you know it, Rye. We're also going to be going eye for an eye on the farewell tonight. And, Rye, you already mentioned it. We are reviewing The Lion King. Yes, and... In honor of The Lion King, which is directed by... John Favreau. Yes, we are going to be playing John Favreau Trivia, Yourself versus Jeff. Okay, He's I'm a ready. director, he's an actor, so be ready for everything that John Favreau has done. Uh, I, and a writer, too. Right? Yes. Yeah. Also, all month of July, Matt, you know we are celebrating Quentin Tarantino here on Cinema Jaw. It's an epic month. So let's start there. Let's start this podcast with a fun fact, Phil. Yes, Celebrating Quentin Tarantino with this fact about the casting for the film Inglorious Bastards. This movie almost didn't happen. There was an issue with the character Hans Landa, a linguistic genius in the film who had to be played by a German actor, according to Tarantino. He wanted Germans playing Germans speaking German. The tricky part was that Landa had to not only speak authentic German, but also deliver a lot of his lines in English, many of which required perfect comedic timing and delivery due to the uh, poetic quality. Quinton says, I was getting to be kind of worried. Unless I found the perfect Landa, I didn't want to make the movie. With one week left, before he had to make the decision, Tarantino saw Christoph Waltz read for the part. It was obvious he was the guy. He could do everything we wanted. He was just amazing, Tarantino said. We were ecstatic when he finished, and we were vomiting all over him. Oh my god, you were amazing, you were fantastic, oh my god, thank you, thank you, thank you, says Tarantino. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences agreed, as Waltz won Oscar for the Best Supporting Actor for his role in this film. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. I also really enjoyed Phil's acting in that. I did too. That was fantastic. He had it really down. Thank yeah. you for not I, vomiting on me. It's amazing. I, I, you know, we're celebrating Quentin Tarantino. I just rewatched The Hateful Eight because it's got me, you know, I gotta in the do mood. that. I gotta do that. How was it, it on a second viewing? Uh, not great, to okay. be honest. Okay. It, it drags a little bit. I still like his his writing, but to be honest, the, the second time through drags a little bit. Yeah, but that Sam Jackson monologue, right? I mean, nobody Crazy. nobody delivers a monologue like Sam Jackson. Right, and so that got me thinking, and and this fact really. Sp- and on too. Looking at all these great characters that Tarantino has given us mm. on the screen, I do have to say that Hans Landa is probably Tarantino's best. Oh, I disagree fully. Fully? Fully. Yes. Wow. Fully. I, I, there's you probably, gotta give it to 
one other. Yes, there is. I mean, it's Jules from Pulp mm, Fiction. I don't think so. Sammy Jackson. I, mm, he's good, but I think he's the Hans, best. No, Hans is more a, a polished of a character. No, I mean, but the, the, he he's a different type of character. I think Jules is a better character. No, I think Hans is. I think it's Jules. Cinema, Cinema War. War. Oof, boy. Jeff really is going to have his hands full with this one. That's, That's a tough argument. It's a Sophie's choice this if ever there was. This is going to be fun. Yes. Wow. Jam-packed, Joe. I love it. I love talking movies. Uh, Matt, you mentioned uh, Jeff York is making his return here on Cinema Jaw. He is a critic. He is an artist. Jeff, welcome back to Cinema Jaw. Thank you. Great to be back here with both of you, or all three of you, actually. So, uh, uh, as Hans Landy would say, that's a bingo. <laughs> there we go. Wow. Score one. one in my corner yeah, early. Geez. I love it. Or He's as already Jules would them. say, say what again, motherfucker. <laughs> Wow. There Score we go. one for me. All right. This is definitely coming up in my argument, too. Foreshadowing. Um, Jeff, I did want to start with your art. The last time you were here, uh, you were kind enough um, to actually draw caricatures of all of us me, Matt, and Phil, the Jaw team. Right. And we got these. They're beautiful. Mine is hanging. I put together a little bit of a, a screening room in my house. I saw that little video that you did of it on Instagram. Yeah. I was very honored. Thank and, you. You know, if I'm watching all these movies, I got to have a dedicated area in my place sure. to watch movies. And so I hung this beautiful artwork that you did of me. And then Matt lately on our Instagram, and this is a, a plug to follow us on Instagram, started doing a lot of these videos, animation videos, and Matt's been able to actually use these drawings in, in fun ways with us talking, with the characters popping up. Excite you when you actually see somebody doing something with the artwork like that? Totally honored and uh, tickled that you're that in love with it. And it really works well because uh, they're very graphic caricatures and the way you use it with the yellow and the black and the white and the graphics of your type and the quotes that you put up your movies works incredibly well. So, yeah, not only am I flattered, but I think you've done a hell of a design job in putting them together, so it makes my art look all the better. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, so thanks for it, because we're using it a lot. And you draw these, uh, we talked about it last time, you draw these movie characters all the time. What was the last one that you put pen and pencil to? Well, I just did uh, Carla Giugino for a TV series that she did, Jet, where I wrote about um, sort of female anti-heroes. Um, but I've done, um, you know, some of the people in film, uh, but I usually if I like a movie, I will draw a caricature of it to sort of go along with the review. So recently I've done Book Smart. Uh, that was a fun one of those. Yeah, two I saw that. 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 Well done. Um, and I did um, uh, Taron Edgerton as Elton John in Rocket Man. Nice, I saw that one. Oh, and, and he retweeted it or something. He did, yeah. yeah. In fact, occasionally the, the celebrities will retweet it. Um, Alison Brie and Charlize Theron did it when I did her and uh, Seth Rogen. Oh, in, in Long Shot? Long Shot, yeah. Nice. In fact, she said, Seth and I have never looked so good, and she gave it the top, you know, the big full screen stuff that you do at the top now on Instagram, so mm -hmm. that was very cool. Wow. Um, and I don't know if I, if you guys are aware of this, but Spike Lee discovered my caricature of Black Klansman on he, Instagram, and he bought it yep. from me. Yeah, and he made kind of a big deal of it, and he posted that on his feed and everything else. So, yeah, occasionally the celebrities buy it or make some noise about it so and, that's nice and now it's on the cinema joy instagram i, I mean it's like ya, what it's else more even What's more left? celebrities come on <laughs> <laughs> but for the jawheads listening to this that have not seen uh this wonderful artwork where, where would you guide them to check out uh, all, all your drawings well they can follow me on instagram if they want of course i'm jeff york chicago where i post my reviews from the establishing shot as well as creative <laughs> screenwriting which i am their uh, official film critic each week do two reviews a week for them as well um i also have jeff york caricature which is on Instagram and also jeffyourcharacters.com, which is where you can find probably about a hundred of my drawings uh, for your entertainment and perhaps uh, inspiration to hire me to buy, uh, to draw something for you that you can buy from me, be it a famous or favorite celebrity or, of course, a family member or spouse or loved one. How like long that. does it normally take you to draw those? Like, say, a movie character, for instance. So you, know, you sit down with Book Smart, does that take you? Half a day, hours. You know, not, I have no idea. Not I'm, too long. I don't In fact, draw. Usually, uh, if the person really sort of impresses me, like you guys, I know you and I've experienced you. So drawing you is fairly easy because I know you. Though I had to get yours in a couple of rounds. Uh, yeah, he's I'm pointing a, towards I'm Matt a, for I'm the jawheads. I'm he's a mysterious. Towards Matt. I'm a mysterious <laughs> character, Jeff. There's <laughs> there's many layers to to Matt K. There are. I was not quite getting you exactly right, but you nailed um, it though in oh, the end. Oh, well, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Yes. Uh, but if I do know them, um, like, a, or they make a certain impression on me from a movie, I can usually get the likeness pretty quick. And that just becomes about how much detail is put in the drawing and then the inking time. So usually if it's one person, 
the whole thing is probably between three and four hours, which isn't too bad. Um, a little less if it's just a face, if it's body and you have to get in the detail of like, oh, I'm giving him a plaid jacket or you know, a, a, a woolly sweater that takes lots of dots to sort of convey that texture. It'll take a little bit longer. Um, it's, it's difficult to draw people when they send you pictures of their favorite pet or this is my girlfriend and I don't know them and you know I guess right because the there's like a soul you have to capture I agree and some personality, characters, yeah. yeah that's right some characters just do kind of the face or you know, get the likeness and those are great guys and they do them quick and they're at fairs and you know parties and stuff like that I've never really been one of those guys for me it's capturing the soul the sort of essence of their personality um, you can give somebody dark eyes if their personality is dark whether they have dark eyes or not and it works in caricature so for me it's always been about getting their personality across and that comes through in movies where they've gotten across that personality of their character to me and, and made me like the film so it's uh, kind of a return almost circle of life if you will how's that i like it i see what you did there <laughs> yeah and, and let us not uh forget that you are writing movie reviews as we mentioned so for for the jawheads there if you're you're guiding someone that wants to read your reviews where's actually the best place do you break it up to these uh, couple sure, different spots sure. or what yeah um i uh, have the establishing shot as you said which is uh, the establishing shot .com, but not for much longer because one of you gentlemen is helping me move on to uh, again he's pointing at me yeah <laughs> also the, the talented one is who he's talking about ah, this son and, of a... and then uh, creative screenwriting is uh, creative screenwriting.com I'm in there twice a week uh, a lot of times it's a review and an essay about the business sort of an editorial take on maybe what's the problem with the horror genre or something like that but uh, generally I write about two or three movie reviews a week how'd you get hooked up with creative screenwriting um, I was picked as one of their um, favorite screenwriters because I've won a bunch of awards by the International Screenwriters Association and the guy who runs that uh, bought creative screenwriting two years ago and called me up and he was a follower of mine on the establishing shot and he asked if I'd like to be their film critic as they relaunch creative screenwriting online so that's where wow. I got that from yeah it's kind of who you know I guess <laughs> oh it's totally totally awesome and uh, how about a plug for yourself on Twitter or Facebook uh, do you, oh sure do you tweet um, sure um, on Twitter I'm Jeff York writer and Jeff York Chicago on Instagram. I know it should probably be Jeff York writer, but it's not just about writing That's all okay. the time. And like I said, Jeff York caricatures both uh, as a second Instagram account as well as a standalone illustration website. Awesome. I highly encourage everyone to go check out his Instagram at the very least. I, I oh, do as you. well. And if we can throw this early uh, tidbit into the fish tank, last time Jeff York was on the show, I know we did movies about artists. It makes but, sense. Makes that's sense. That's right. We did. That was get, so much fun. Yeah. Get the jaw number out uh, in the middle of the show there, <laughs> Phil. Now, Jeff, we like to end these uh, guest interviews with a silly cinema cue, usually having to do with the theme. Okay. Phil, you got something for Jeff? Yeah, Jeff. So we've been talking about Quentin Tarantino a lot tonight. Uh, yes. Quentin is famous for uh, being a part of movies that people think he directed, but he actually didn't. These are like Sin City and right. uh, From Dusk Till Dawn. True romance. Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, so out of all of the many non-Tarantino Tarantino films, what do you think is the most, uh, you can sense him the most in? Well, that's a really good question. I would probably have to say true romance in the sense that he wrote it, and I think mm -hmm. um, they stayed pretty close to his script in that. Uh, the crazy characters, the... Uh, sort of uh, the all violence, in, the all in romance, the all in violence, um, giving the characters, you know, even if they're small parts, a lot to do and a lot of uh, interesting screen time. Uh, so, probably I would say that one. Um, I'm glad you didn't ask me about his attempt at being an actor for a while. That was <laughs> never really worked out. And they gave him a number of chances. He even gave himself a number of chances. He still showed up in Django and Chain. It's like, please, Quentin, stop putting yourself in your movies. But, but at least in Django, it was a very, very small part. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But he was trying to do an Australian accent. I'm not sure it quite worked. But Yeah, mm. I agree. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Jeff will be sitting in on this entire jaw. He has his top five favorite movie kings and he also saw the lion king so we got you know this will be a good discussion right absolutely yeah. this is going, Matata. yes three great I critics like talking about it all right brings us to eye for an eye yes this week on eye for an eye the farewell a headstrong chinese american woman returns to china when her beloved grandmother is diagnosed with terminal cancer she struggles with her family's decision to keep their grandma in the dark about her own illness they all stage an impromptu wedding to see their grandma one last time. 
The film stars Aquafina, and it is written and directed by Lulu Wang, who originally told this story on the podcast This American Life. Rai, we throw it on over to you. Full disclosure, had the chance to catch this one much earlier, uh, about a month, two months ago, at the Chicago Critics Film Fest, uh, the one that uh, Mr. Brian Talrico helps run and we promote here on Cinema Jaw. It was over at the Music Box, and this was a complete highlight of the festival for me. And truth be told, one of the best films I think I've seen in all of 2019. That's all I'm going to say for it right now because we are planning to give it the full review next week. Uh, for the sake of interested or ignore, hell yeah, interested. <laughs> Jeff? I happen to see it at that film festival, too, which is one of the best film festivals around. It's really it is. an opportunity to see really interesting films that most of us would not get a chance to because these guys go to film festivals that we can't all schlep to. And highly stuff. curated. Yeah, highly curated and very smart picks. Uh, it was just this sort of honest sketch of this person's life in a couple of days with her extended family and so many vivid characters and it you know made you laugh and makes you cry and, and, and that's saying a lot I mean that's an old cliche but they, they don't make many movies like that anymore so definitely recommend Matt okay uh, big fan of Aquafina uh, I, I think she's great and I've also listened to the This American Life episode with this story so yeah and plus all the buzz I'm big time interested Phil uh, Parrot, everything you guys have said. Uh, Aquafina just seems like the... I don't know if there's anybody who doesn't like her because she's just a very likable person. Uh, and then another thing that I've said on the show multiple times before, uh, just as a personal thing, Asian-American representation is super important to me. Uh, I produce another podcast for the, the co-op called the Ajima Podcast where we talk about just how important that is, and it's great. I can't miss it. No doubt about it. Four interested for the farewell, and like we said, me and Jeff saw it, and we're, we're already recommending. So, do you think at some point Aquafina, uh, which is a stage name, is it not? Is, yes. Is, so, is she going to do like a Dwayne the Rock Johnson thing at some point? Like, <laughs> Who knows, if, right? If, if this gets That's an right. Oscar, are we going to find out Aquafina's given <laughs> name? Right. Lady sure. Gaga didn't, uh, you know, change her name for Star Wars. That's right? true. I think it's because the Rock doesn't wrestle anymore. Yeah. You know, well, whatever. Aquafina I mean, is still a musician. Okay, all right. That's, Lake, a, good, Lady that's Gaga. a good point. Uh, but that's a very good question because Aquafina. Well, you know, she, it's one of those great single names, though. Like nobody well, else would have it. And, so. and some people, I mean, there may be some Unless people the out there bottle. that are still a little confused on who exactly she was. For me, uh, it was Crazy Rich Asians, where mm -hmm. I was like, oh my god, who is this? Is that person that is so funny? Her voice, just with her. Her, you know, the way she looks on screen, it just doesn't quite match. But then once you get to know her, it does. Right. Was she in the Sandy Bullock uh, reboot of Oceans? The Oceans? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's and right. she was in that as and well. And she's probably right. one she's of the, the better best part. part. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And so, yeah, then all of a sudden I saw her in this. And this is a whole nother level because this is a little bit more drama from her. I mean, it still has the comedy and it's funny. But we're finally seeing a little bit of, quote unquote, acting chops from Aquafina. And I'm with you, my friend, that uh, there's not enough films about all different kinds of groups of people, particularly the Asian community, and to see this filled with all these terrific actors, most of them who nobody has ever seen before, uh, and, and they were all so vivid and great performances. It's a, it's a very special movie, and again, there should be more movies like that every year with all mm -hmm. kinds of stories being told from all different corners of the world and different uh, segmentations and stuff, so bravo uh -huh. to it. Yep. We'll be talking about it more next week. Uh, speaking of new movies, Matt, The Lion King, right? Back mm. in 1994, the world got to know names such as Mufasa, Zimba, Scar, Zazu, phrases like the circle of life, Hakuna Matata. The film would make over $900 million wow. worldwide, sell millions of toys, inspire a Broadway musical, and win two Oscars, one for best score and one for best song. It is a film that everyone knows and most love. So how would a live action remake or basically another animated remake of an animated film do? Is it needed? We got a seat right on Pride Rock and checked out the latest version from Disney. Life's not fair. Is it, my little friend? While some are born to feast, others spend their lives in the dark. <laughs> begging for scraps. Matt, I don't want to spend a ton of time on the story. Just a quick recap should do. The lions rule the land, 
Mufasa has a newborn, Simba, who is presented to the kingdom in an extremely cinematic posed moment. Everyone in the land is happy except for Mufasa's brother, Scar. He will never be able to call Simba his king. So he hatches a plan to get rid of his brother and newborn cub. He will then rule the land himself. Simba, meanwhile, finds new friends, grows bigger, and comes back to take the throne. The end. Let's be honest. Well, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, though. On paper, there's not much there. What made the first film such a hit was the combination of the fantastic voice work, amazing musical numbers, top-notch animation, and characters that we truly cared about. Did this film have those same elements? I'm not so sure it had all of them. For starters, this is a fairly safe remake in that it does not change much from the 94 version. The musical numbers did nothing, in my opinion, to actually elevate the originals. As good, mm, probably slightly worse, in my opinion. As far as attachment to the characters, I, I don't know, maybe it's me, but I think it's easier to actually care for a hand-drawn lion than it was for the computer-generated ones I saw in this screening. As for the voice work, I think this is where the film shines. Boy, did this one really need Seth Rogen. I mean, as soon as his character comes on screen, his Pumbaa, it, it might have been the best thing here for me. The, the leads here, Danny Glover, uh, Beyonce pops up. Donald Glover. Donald Glover, thank you. Donald Glover and Beyonce, decent. But I didn't think anything uh, extremely special. When Beyonce sings, yes, nailed it. But I was not a fan of her voice work in general as the character. Something about it just was a little off. And why bring back James Earl Jones? Um, coming out of the theater, I thought, well, what was I expecting to begin with? And I guess I'm not sure. I just saw a computer-generated telling of The Lion King. Okay. What else is playing? Wow. I, so <laughs> here's the thing. Um, first of all, I couldn't disagree with you more on Seth Rogen. Boy, did he drag this thing down for what? me. What? Totally. He was the best part of the not movie. Not at all. Yes, he no, was. No. Hands down, he was the best part of the and movie. boy, who told him to sing? They could have got a stand-in. No. Oh, his voice is so terrible. It totally worked. It totally didn't work. Mm -hmm. when, when he's, you know, uh, Pumbaa has this high note, you know, like uh, when he's singing When I Was a Young Warthog, you know, like in, in the Hakuna Matata song. Right. And he, he could have gone for it, and he just doesn't, and falls flat on his face. And I, I did not like Seth Rogen at all. In fact, I think he was the worst part. He, he, here's the thing, guys, right? The Lion King, there, there are animated classics, uh, like Aladdin is an animated classic. And I actually really enjoyed the remake, and, and it updated it just enough with giving Jasmine some more depth. But The Lion King is not an animated classic. It's a freaking masterpiece. It is frame it hanging on the wall. It, it should not have been remade. This is, I agree with you, Ryan totally safe territory it's basically shot for shot but damn it if the hair on my arm didn't stand up during the circle of life at the beginning when you know i was literally chills down my spine and i will say one of the things that the film did exceptionally well was exactly how good the animals looked i thought for a while you can almost say you were watching uh, a National Geographic or Planet Earth, especially there was a slow motion uh, almost hunt scene where they're running through and I'm like, wow, this looks like something you would see when you're watching a nature show. Was that a highlight for you, Jeff? You know, it was. In fact, it reminded me of some of those Disney films that have come out lately uh, about nature and, and those kind of things that are sure. on the big screen. It had that believability to it. Uh, the technique is called photoreal, as they like to describe it, but it's extraordinary uh, computer-generated graphics. I mean, right now, it is so technically superb that you can't really see where it's not real. I mean, I, I, the, the, the amount of detail, the hair, the, the movements, one of the things I thought was very well done about it, and I credit John Favreau for it, is they didn't have the animals do anything that they could not do. They didn't over-exaggerate their eye expressions. Except their, speaking. Except for speaking, of course, right. But like they didn't do the brows moving, or they didn't have them moving in ways that their bodies couldn't. In fact, a lot of that... The action scenes where they're fighting and, and mauling each other are, are within the limits of the physics of the and, animal kingdom. And, and so even, that was very and impressive. Even to the degree you almost of, forget that you're watching something that is right. photoreal creation. You know, that's, even there's even not to a the single animal probably the, the up two there. characters are just sort of talking, they right. may just sort of swat each other with a paw. Something that maybe two lions or cubs would do just in the, in the wild. Right. I like that. 
Though I, I liked it better than you did, Rye. I don't know if you were a thumbs up or a thumb. Uh, I, I agree with you that it was. Is this trip really necessary? As the old slogan from the '40s and '50s goes, no. But then again, I think that's sort of the the problem with Hollywood now. Everything is getting rebooted, relaunched, reinterpreted. Disney has made now a cottage industry out of taking animated films, classic or masterpieces, and giving them the uh, sort of live action treatment. It started with. Um, 101 Dalmatians that led to a sequel because it was so successful and occasionally the films come along and I think plus the material or better the animated classic I think Kenneth Branagh's version of Cinderella we're deepened. getting them fast and furious now like yeah. two I mean what's yeah, it been every, at least, well Three this year sure. there was Dumbo Aladdin and now Lion King um, sometimes they go too far afield I think Dumbo was too much about the human characters there's not a human character in the Dumbo animated mm -hmm. uh, it, it maybe wasn't the right one to do this one to your point it is very very almost sort of shot for shot, uh, scene for scene, set piece for set piece, the, the, the animated masterpiece. Uh, they do it really well. I think it's very involving. I'll tell you one thing that I have found is a trick to doing some of these things as a critic is we'll find that our brethren a lot of times will say, I'm catching up with the animated Lion King tonight before seeing it tomorrow in the theater. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's probably going to pale in comparison. And two, uh, I think you want to walk in and be fairly surprised because that's what they're banking on. This is for a new audience mm -hmm. that maybe hasn't seen the animated kind or this is a new one, as well as people who have fond memories of the, of the masterpiece, as you said, uh, Matt. But, uh, you know, some people objected to The Lion King being done on Broadway, but Julie Tamer directed that, produced that. She's also one of the producers here, made sure that, you know, there was enough novelty in it for uh, us to be dazzled and I saw that on Broadway where they actually had human actors on screen sort of dressed up them wearing headdresses because mm -hmm. they didn't want to try to make them look like they were in animal costumes like some sort of cheesy thing from Halloween spirit um, and that was very interesting this too I think is that way and they do some other things that I think are interesting they talk sing most of the songs there's not all of the songbook in the movie either because I think that takes you a little bit out of this sort of reality version they got when, when Scar sings uh, be prepared it starts almost as a soliloquy going into Shakespearean poetry and then there's a little bit of singing as Chewetel Ejiofor who does a really good job reprising right. Jeremy that, Irons that does that voice was great he was terrific in he fact was. I thought he added some different depth to it that was you know, not reliant on sort of the Jeremy Irons cliche villain stuff that he could do, you know, almost in his sleep as, mm. scar, as, as great as that performance was. We could was. say this was almost spoken word. Yes, but it was like spoken word, and I think they did that. I think Favreau made that decision just like he did in The Jungle Book to keep it a little bit more grounded in reality because if there was too much Broadway and, and songs and lyricism and, you know, stuff like that, it might have been too much, although they do get a little bit of that in the Hakuna Matata. But then I think also because you've got... Um, um, you know, the, the Akuna Matata song is a little bit more of a feel good where everybody kind of chimes in. You get the chorus behind Timon and Pumbaa singing that. It, it allowed a little bit of that. But it's funny how some of the songs, like Circle of Life, is not sung by any animals. You don't see any of the zebras or the antelopes singing it. It's just on the soundtrack. Well, you know? I'm pretty, pretty sure that's how they did it in the original. They did. They did. But I'm just saying that they didn't attempt to make that song into something that, you know, the entire uh, ensemble wing. The menagerie. Sings, you know, yeah, the menagerie sings. <laughs> see, I felt the film, it took like a a, a long time to get going where you weren't laughing and maybe because we're familiar with the story as well sure. so I, I'm, I'm not necessarily that drawn in emotionally and I wasn't uh, laughing along there's nothing really too funny in the beginning up until Seth Rogen pops up that's why once uh, he and what, what's the other sidekicks uh, uh, Timo Timbo yeah. I mean once those two pop up on screen all right it starts to become a movie right. it starts yeah. to become a little fun out there and enjoyable for me one thing I was curious about, though, maybe if you guys saw the animated classic or masterpiece, as Matt says <laughs> recently, um, I felt that they introduced them quite late here. Maybe it I don't was. remember I it being an hour into the movie before two key characters show up. But well, I'm pretty I sure the animated they, version is shorter. Shorter, yeah. So that's part Throw of it. Throw it in the fish tank, the run times of the two. Now, I looked at my watch. This one came in at about 145, 150. Right. So. Okay, here's, here's the thing. Uh, so I have, I have a five-year-old right now, right? And I was thinking as I was watching this movie, oh, wow, he would really, really love this movie. And then it got to some of the scarier beats. And I don't know. There's something about animation that allows you to see things that are a little scarier and know that it's not real, so it's okay. Right. But when you're watching the real animals and the hyenas are snapping their jaws at the, the, the cub lions, 
I don't know if I would show this to a five-year-old. That's a great point, Matt, because I'd have to tell you, I thought the hyenas here were rather terrifying. I mean, their <laughs> honest faces oh, are come hideous. Come on, Jeff. Well, no, I mean, I'm just saying as far as, you know. I agree well, with Jeff, they, 100%. They look very, oh, absolutely. very scary. They look like bats almost, you know, and they're filling the screen. And they're, they're ugly. And there are a bunch of them, and there's a pack of them always, it seemed. Um, right. in, the, have, in the animation, it's it's Whoopi Goldberg. The, the hyenas are laughable. I mean, yes, they're menace, but they're also a bit of comedic relief, too. Right, that's right. Not so much in this. Right. Even though there's, uh, they you know, Keegan Michael comedy. Key is there, but I mean, right. it's, uh, it's, it's, I thought the touches. felt flat there. It's a little bit of touches, you know, just to build up these characters who are sort of invading each other's space. I'll tell you to your point, Matt, where that is really illustrated, and suddenly you go like, damn, when it's made to look photoreal like that, it becomes truly terrifying, is Scar's demise at the end in the animation is shot almost the same way here with this live action sort of look and feel but it's much scarier here because you realize he's going to be torn from limb to limb by this pack of hyenas where in the animated version you see a little bit of the shadow on the wall and then it kind of just keeps going on and yeah. that's how Disney did death a lot you mm -hmm. know they cut away they drift away there was a little suggestion of it in the shadows or you'd see Ursula you know sort of fall but you didn't see her you know bleeding out from the the, <laughs> the, the ship right. stabbing right. her right in the heart and suddenly it's when it's so realistic looking you're like oh my god God, that line is going to be ripped to shreds. It's like, do I want to think about that? I don't think your five-year-old does. No, and there's another moment, and and I, I won't I won't spoil it. This, is a, I mean, there may be somebody out there who hasn't seen the original Lion King. Yeah, spoilers um, alert. We've already given away a lot. I don't think so. <laughs> We're fine. So uh, there's a there's a character, uh, a beloved character who uh, gets injured in a pretty serious way uh, during a stampede, right. and. In the, again, in the animated classic, I remember that being a, a bit of a gut punch, but in this one, I, you feel it ten times more because it's it, real, and I'm using air quotes here. Right, right. So, yeah, and I don't know if I show that to my five-year-old. Probably not. I like the stampede scene. You could feel the bass in the theater, which I, I, I think it made that whole scene uh, seem a little bit more realistic, the sound that they used. I liked it. I wonder, too, guys, is this one of those movies that maybe where the for lack of a better term, business executive kind of angle on it is very shrewd. For example, if there are people who might reject the cell animation because, oh, that doesn't look like Pixar. It's 2D animation and it's cell animation, which is, you know, so 30 years ago. To a new audience, this might be a way of getting them into the story in a way that maybe they would reject the crudeness, the oldness, the, you know, it's just the way certain people reject black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does look so incredibly real. And maybe in some respects, it adds more weight to the death scenes and some of the violence in here. Uh, I don't know. Emotion, I mean, it, it might be a way of, you know, really speaking to that new audience and people like us who regard it as a masterpiece or have these great fond memories. We're going to be mixed even if we can admire a lot of it because we have such f affection going on 30 years for the the original. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, uh, emotionally, were, were you, do, I said I was more attached to the original, to the animated characters, than I was here. Am I on to something, or did you guys feel the reverse, and you actually did feel quite a bit of emotion to these characters? I'll say this. I had a harder time telling apart uh, young, the, the, the two cubs, when Nala and Simba are, are young. In the animated version, they're different. They're a slightly different color, and I guess they kind of do that here, but it's not strong enough. So I had a difficult time telling some of the characters apart, like Simba's mother, for example, when she's laying amongst the other lionesses. I, I really couldn't say, "Oh, that's the one." I don't know. So yeah, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Although going off of something Jeff said earlier, uh, how the characters don't do anything that that real lions or cats can't. Yet he still manages to get great expressions out of them when when uh, Simba is has grown and and Nala meets him at, and and they go and frolic in the forest for a bit and they're lapping water out of uh, a stream or something. He says something and then walks away from her and she has a look on her face and this is like again real in air quotes lion but he he captures that so I don't know. I'm on the fence on that one, right? Big time. Well, I don't think you ever get a second chance to make a first impression. So if we have uh, an original in our head, no matter how well this one is done or fantastically we may love it, it still can't entirely replace the original impression that the fresh 
animated classic masterpiece from so many years ago made. Having said that, I admired this a lot and I liked it and I forgot some of those beats and some of those things because I don't think I've seen that movie in 20 years. I think I saw it on TV or video when it came out uh, oh so many decades ago, but uh, I was sort of reintroduced to it because I, I knew some of it, but some of it I'd forgotten and didn't realize how it had happened. Um, so I liked it more than you did, but I think it's maybe aimed more at people who this would be a sort of a new experience for them, and maybe they would not be able to be brought in as well from the masterpiece version that so many of us who are long enough and lived long enough to know it as a kid or an adult back then. Influence-wise, I I've obviously saw the Jungle Book, which also John Favreau did. Yeah, right. No brainer. A anything yeah. else that you guys saw? This one really seemed like it had heavy influence from that. Well, it's the hero's journey. Big time. Right. I mean, like, he, he goes through the cave, he meets the wizard, he resists the call to action the, the whole nine yards. So, you know, take your pick. Star Wars. There you go. I do think that Favreau is really a good director of actors, and I know that seems weird when you have all of this, this these special effects going on, but to your point, Matt, earlier, is he found ways to bring across the performance without the voice, uh, with the limitations of animals, with casts of characters that look all the same, uh, very True. well in True. a hesitation on them before they move their neck or they bow their head or the eyes hang on somebody staring at them a touch longer than normal. And, you know, all the time, while well, making it seem very real. So he's a very good director of actors. I think he's an actor, you know, obviously himself, so he knows he's an actor's actor, Here's a director's actor and all that stuff. And that even shows here where... Really, he has no humans on screen. He did in the Jungle Book, of course. He got to work with the young right. boy and all the other CGI characters around him. But here it was uh, bereft of that. And yet the performances and the sort of actorliness comes through in these animals uh, quite well. As Here, here's a, a good point. hypothetical for you. Let's take away that this was an original, that the original Jungle uh, Lion King didn't never took place mm -hmm, and right. this was the first right. iteration that we were seeing of it would this be hailed as a masterpiece no thing not I, and no. i think the thing that would have been the strange thing is you would have probably not done it with music i think if you had just done it as okay these are animals talking to themselves in this world like babe you know where they they talk amongst themselves but somehow when they're around the the farmer, they don't. Uh, that I, I, I buy that, I believe that, but I think if you had added songs to it and suddenly you're asking us to believe that these animals talk and then also break into sort of Broadway-esque uh, show tunes, it might have seemed a really mixed bag. And there's a touch of that for mm -hmm. us because it's easier when you have cartoons where we grew up with Bugs Bunny, we grew up with Popeye the Sailor and all the Warner Brothers cartoons where Bugs Bunny would sing right at the beginning, you know, light the lights, you know, tonight, tonight, hit the... Um, no more rehearsing, <laughs> rehearsing a part. We know every part by heart. There he um, goes. Thank you. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, it would have been, I think it seemed a little bit like an odd mix of realism and... Fantastical. Any movie poster quote, Matt? No, still working on mine. Yeah. What, what do you got, Ryan? I want. I can't feel the love tonight. <laughs> oh. well, that's Which good. is a little harsh, though. It's a little harsh because I don't want to completely poo-poo this movie. There are some good qualities to it. So there are. Yeah. All right. Let's go around the room and assign Jaws. We're on a four-jaw scale, Matt. I'll start it off. Uh, I, I would give this a strong two and a half, almost two and three quarters. It's, it's, it's worth watching. I would give it three. I think they did a really good job of recreating a lot of the greatness of that masterpiece and making it interesting enough uh, just on the physicality of it that they created this whole world, all these different animals, realistic movement. Uh, and like I said, I haven't seen it in a long time, so it did uh, resonate with me more than maybe uh, some of the more purists uh, out there in fandom. And I would go two Jaws, hmm. so middle of the road. I, and my criticisms being, one, I didn't feel uh, the emotional connection as I did to the original. And then secondly, I'm not big on these shot-for-shot -shot remakes. I'd rather them take a little bit more chance and change it up a little bit. I'm not saying I need tons of different scenes or new characters added, but just take like a what little they did bit with Aladdin. more. Right, take a little bit more. Do you think part of it, though, Rye, is the risk. fact that this one is so beloved? It is considered one of the absolute top Disney masterpieces. And I mean, I think Beauty and the Beast had a little bit of that same thing where they didn't change it too much, where something like Cinderella, they 
they added more feminism. Mm -hmm. They changed the stepmother character into a woman who had her own sort of problems and baggage that made her an, an evil stepmother without the sort of cliche and the two-dimensional version of it that was in the original animated version of that. I think for Disney, it's just how close do you keep this? I think with this one, they said, we can't change much. Mm -hmm. It has to be so close because people are going to freak out if it's too far afield. Hmm. All right. We're Dumbo. Who remembers Dumbo? It's from the 40s. Right. You know, and, and it so wasn't much said, of a movie. Yeah, it wasn't. It was 40 minutes. Right. And it was just animals. And the major character other than Dumbo it, is the little mouse. And he's not even in the remake. That movie's only get, 40 minutes long? Yeah, it's 40 yes. minutes the, long. The biggest mistake with wow. the Dumbo remake is... It just shouldn't humans. have been made. Yeah, too many humans <laughs> it, making it. Was, it. Yeah, yeah. It, don't do Where it. Where is Timothy there, J. Mouse? I want him. I don't want ones, Colin Farrell's story. Right. There's certain <laughs> movies that are going to translate. Well, Dumbo wasn't one of them. They shouldn't have done it. All right. Again, recapping, two and a half for Matt, three jaws from Jeff, two jaws for me for The Lion King. Hmm. That's where we stand. A little divisive there. It is. Brings us to our top five list. We keep on rolling on here on Cinema Jaw and in honor of The Lion King our top five favorite movie kinks. Now, when we brought this up, me and Matt were talking. Seems like a great idea. I sit down to do the list. <laughs> I actually had a tough time coming up with uh, five, and I'll start this discussion. I realized okay. that... You had a tough time, huh? Uh, well, kings, I realize, play a lot of evil characters in movies. But that's okay. I know. Don't get me wrong. And I got some of those evil characters well, on. As do I. Right. But it's amazing, <laughs> actually, how many. It, in fact, I'd say 80% of the kings are evil in the movies, I've, I've come to realize. Yeah, people in power generally don't make the best heroes. <laughs> they have to have stammers in order for them to be relatable. The only ones we're, we're probably going to highlight are the ones that become king at like the end of the movie that we can probably highlight. But they're, it's like their quest to be king, and then they're king. All right, now I'll... Highlight them, but very seldom do you got a very, uh, you know, high worthy king all the way throughout the movie. You're gonna hate my list, Ryan. I just can't wait to ruin your day. Jeff, you're getting to start it this week. What do you got sitting at number five? Well, I'm going to hopefully not get you mad either, Ryan. Um, I tried to mix it up a little bit. As I was thinking of kings that I really like from it, I found myself gravitating away from the strict version of king. Um, and as I did that, I thought, well, I can come up with all these characters that have the name king and king characters, but they aren't necessarily royalty. Okay. I have a couple here that subscribe to what I think your list will be more like, but I'm going to give you some left field stuff, including this very first one. In fifth position, I have a 1996 underappreciated comedy called Kingpin, uh, directed by the Ferrelli brothers. Yes. And uh, long before Peter had Vigo and Marshal Mar Ali hit the road or Cameron got jizz in her hair, he and his brother had Woody Harrelson battle Bill Murray for kingpin status at the bowling alley. Now, this film was incredibly sophomoric and dirty and cheesy and, yes, freaking hilarious. <laughs> it's one of my uh, favorites. i got to be honest. I've seen I it a too. dozen it, times. Me Great too. Bill I can Murray quote character. it all day long, <laughs> and yet it is so politically incorrect. I don't know if they could necessarily make it today. I mean, they make fun of handicapped people, the Amish, comb-overs, cunnilingus, and male and female nipples. And I loved every awful, <laughs> wrong moment of it. Uh, Woody of does, which there are plenty. There are plenty. Woody does lose the championship uh, and does not reign as the king of the bowling alley, but but he does get the girl, wins his self-respect, and even the uh, admiration of the Amish community for his tutoring of their uh, <laughs> sort of long-lost uh, son, Randy Quaid. Uh, though they do call his girlfriend whore as he rides off in his son's <laughs> with her. Of course. So there you go, Kingpin in 1996. Funny story about that one. I remember walking in, and my brother and his friends were watching the movie. It was already out on VHS. I hadn't seen it. And I walked in. And, and just being like, what are they watching? Because it's just so lowbrow. You know, what is this? And they're laughing and laughing. And like, I left the room. And then later I rented it, and there I was right along with them. Yeah. Classic. <clears throat> well done, Ryan. I'm glad you caught up with Kingpin. <laughs> All right, that swings it to me. And if you didn't like Jeff's pick, Ryan, I can almost guarantee you're not going to like Jeff's pick. Right, Thank good, you. Good, Thank Jesus. <laughs> Uh, this this one came to me by way of Mike McPadden, who used to write for Mr. Skin and then went on to Mr. write... Mr. Skin? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he went on to write books <laughs> like heavy metal movies, and uh, he's a big fan of genre exploitation, this sure, kind of thing. Sure, sure. This is um, a, a movie from 1983. It is a classic teen sex comedy. Before he was Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite, and before he was Laszlo Holyfield from Real Genius... 
John Grise played a character called King Vidiot in this movie, <laughs> Joysticks. And I didn't believe McPadden. Here goes Ryan. <laughs> oh, no. I, he's leaving the studio, folks. <laughs> Come back. I, Come I back. did not believe McPadden when when he told me to watch this this performance. You I'm sure, Rai, you love Laszlo Holyfield. I I, have not, I don't even know him. From from Real Genius. I, I mean I can't remember him. Oh my god. Jeez, pearls before swine here. <laughs> so th- this character, he literally chews scenery. I mean he, so he, he goes in real quick. He has this confrontation with this businessman who wants to hire him to go into the arcade and make havoc so he can shut down the arcade because he's an old businessman and doesn't like people having fun. And he, he goes to have this meeting and he climbs in through the window and the guy's just sitting there in his living room. He's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, you said you wanted to talk. I'm like, yeah, why didn't you use the door? I don't like doors. And he's like, all right, we'll have a seat. He kicks over the chair and he says, I don't like seats. Oh, and, then, <laughs> and then he starts literally chewing the scenery. Off. Where's the off button? He literally chews the scenery. <laughs> I mean, he picks it up and puts it in his mouth. Oh, my goodness. It's, listen, YouTube King Vidiot. 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 You can call him your highness. Nice. All right. So I'm the only one with an actual king at my number five. <laughs> it's debatable. <laughs> boy, oh, boy. I've got I, one at number four. Yeah, He's got right. his loyal subjects. Boy, this is... The other thing, too, is we, we do the show quite a bit, so I always am looking for an excuse to talk about movies I've never brought up on the podcast. Oh, there you go. And this one at number five, I know I've never talked about, came out in 1999. It is Jodie Foster, and the title of the film is Anna and the King. Ah, yes. Yeah. Which is just a, a different version of The King and I. Right. Um, and this is Jodie Foster. And at the time, I didn't know who the actor was, very famous uh, actor, Chow Young fat who a year later, I believe it was a year later, can we throw that in the fish tank? Uh, Anna and the King, and a year later, I think, was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And then I, I saw him back to back, like, who, who is this guy? This guy's great. And then I come to find out that, you know, he's got this humongous career and just new to us American right. viewers, you know? right. but Foster plays uh, a teacher who goes over to teach the King's children. He has multiple children from multiple wives and it's the differences between East and West philosophy. He doesn't think that one man can even have just one wife. And of course, well, he is in the uh, presence of Jodie Foster. He realizes, yes, one woman could be enough for a man if it's Jodie Foster, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, that's the message, right? No, I'm joking. But but of course, there, there's some of that, like the East versus West, the philosophies of it all. Yeah. And I actually had, it, it's it, fascinating on this, is I went over to Thailand for a vacation. I went to the, the uh, Golden Palace, and I was researching. I went and I watched this movie afterwards, like, oh, I remember this took place there. But... Thailand didn't even let them film there at all, not in the country at all. In fact, it's banned. They don't believe uh, that it, it was cast in a good light. Oh, no uh, kidding. So mm, on and so forth. So it's, it's rather interesting, um, the whole story of, you know, was it even made there? What, what, is, what does the actual country of Thailand believe? So, Sure. Fascinating. Yeah. But I enjoyed it. I do think if you haven't seen Anna and the King and you're looking for a strong Jodie Foster performance, it's, it's, it's worthy. So, well I done. remember liking it at the time, for yeah. sure. All right, into our fours we go. Okay. Jeff says he has a real king here. I do, and uh, it's um, a czar. Uh, it is a film called Nicholas and Alexandra, uh, 1971, uh, directed by Franklin Schaffner, who the year before won the Oscar for directing Patton. He also had directed Planet of the Apes and Boys from Brazil in a, a rather storied career. But this one is about the famous czar of Russia, the Russian king, and it tells the story of how Nicholas wed the German princess Alexandra. Their marriage was unpopular with the Russian people as the poor people were already starting to revolt. And the situation was not improved when he had four daughters. And finally, when he bears a son as an heir, the, the kid is a hemophiliac and he's only able to stem the bleeding and the sickness by a fanatical monk who we all know it was Rasputin. It's a very serious, very dramatic version of it. It shows how difficult it is to rule. And I think it's interesting with all the talk of oligarchs and Russia and sort of, you know, the dictators that uh, our current president admires and stuff. This shows <laughs> how quickly a leader can get out of touch with his own family, his own rule, certainly the people, and become sort of this feckless fool who really uh, trusts so many of the wrong people really right up until the very end. It's a very tragic film, but it's a fascinating study of 
how even though you have sort of all the power infinite in the power, world yeah. and infinite power, you can be completely powerless and lacking control and lacking the ability to really mm -hmm. make your life right. So it's a fascinating version of the downside of being a king. And, and the name one more time? Nicholas and Alexandra. I like it. He was the last czar. Yes, and I believe there is a TV show on Netflix. It just started. They're doing, right. I think, a six-hour version of it. So yeah, yeah, it's about that, okay. Yes, I have not seen it yet, but again, sort of for a new audience. It's right. like, this is probably too old for modern people. You were, you were so describing this, and I was like, man, it, it almost sounds like that Netflix. Right, yes. okay. <laughs> Retelling. Like it. There you go. Nice. All right, that swings it to me. In 1999, Ryan, uh, George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, and Ice Cube gave us three kings. <laughs> and... I Very love good. annoying you. This is so much fun. Um, I, you know what? The thing is, what was that movie that came out this year with um, um, Bat Fleck? Do you remember the one I'm talking about where they go and they try to rob the, the drug dealers yeah, in Mexico? Yeah, we reviewed it here on the, uh, we did. the show. Oh, was that uh, the Triple one with... Frontier. Yes. Thank you, Triple Frontier. Right. So this is like a good version of Triple yes. Frontier. Yes. Um, it's, it's set during the, well, just after the, the Iraq War, the first one, the one in the 90s. And these three soldiers f hear about uh, a, a cache of, of gold that, that the, um, the Iraqis have hidden in this bunker. So they go after it, and Marky Mark gets captured, and they have to trade and rescue and help uh, fight the, the Iraqi guard with the rebels. And uh, along the way, they learn to become good people, and it's kind of a morality tale. But it's way better movie than it should be. A way better movie than it should be. Like, because you look on the surface, this was before Wahlberg was uh, respected. Right. Okay. Right. And, and, you know, debatable even today whether or not he is respected. I, I have a lot of respect for him. But at this time, he was almost dismissed. And Ice Cube, he'd done Friday, I guess, maybe, right. in 99? It also cemented <laughs> Clooney as an actor who you could count on delivering good performances because he'd be given a number of choices early on that did not resonate, not until um, he did... Siri uh, Siriana, right? Well, well, well before that, he did... Um, out of Sight, where he played opposite Jennifer right. Lopez in the Elmore Leonard story that was directed by Steven Soderbergh. This was his follow-up, I believe, to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it sort of cemented him as like a really good screen actor and, and a bona fide movie star. But speaking of directors, of it should be noted that Three Kings was directed by David, David o. Russell. o. Russell. That's right. So you, you see that there was some talent there. Like yep. when you're saying... And written. It's, yeah, right. And it's way better than it should be. But when you're looking at who actually wrote and directed it, it sort of makes sense on why it was probably so good. Right. I agree, but I think it was out of left field. Anyway, that's my pick. What do you got there, Ryan? All right, my number uh, four actually is one of these evil kings <laughs> that I, I spoke of, one that you absolutely hate and one that just makes you cheer for the hero of the film that much more. The hero of the film played by Mel Gibson. Oh, damn it, you stole one of mine. In Braveheart. Uh, the king is King Edward I, better known as Longshanks in the movie <laughs> Braveheart. And I, I've quoted Braveheart uh, a ton. I, I, I was fascinated with the movie. I loved it a ton. And, and now when I go back, I don't think it holds up it, probably as much as I loved it. Not to say it's a bad movie by any means, but I don't put it on that mantle like I, I used to. Well, now you see all the flaws. Right. But the king in this movie is just so evil and so vile. And I love there's this uh, particular line where uh, the war starts. He thinks he's going to already, or the battle. This is like the big battle on the field. And he thinks he's already going to win. And he's like, bring me Wallace's head, dead or alive. And he just walks away. But little does he know that uh, Wallace has got something planned for, for the whole thing and, you know. I, I, there's another line in that battle scene where, where he's like, uh, he, he says, let the archers loose their arrows. And one of his uh, henchmen says, well, won't we hit our troops? And he's like, yes, but we'll hit theirs too. Yes. <laughs> he is ruthless. Oh, uh, there's a scene with his son and his son's lover, uh, who's he's appointed to his advisor. And he's like, he, he basically puts his arm around the guy and he's like, oh, you're his and then advisor. He him out the window. Yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. It's oh, great. Love that scene. Villain. And, and actually watching him Real die, villain. he's got this cough. Um, and I don't even have the actor's name written down in my oh, notes. that's a good... Throw it in the jaw box. Uh, yeah, throw Patrick it in the fish McGowan. tank. Oh, you know it. Yes, there Patrick McGowan. Yeah, he's and great. And he dies before Wallace, Wallace. does. Uh, yep. 
just before. He just before, but he beat him. It was tuberculosis <laughs> or something? He gets sick. Yeah, in yeah. the movie, they actually portray him dying as she's telling him that his line uh, dies with him yes. because uh, the the wife of the king had actually slept, or the prince had actually slept with William Wallace, and that she was going to carry the princess. Did yeah, right, the, right, right. I, I don't know how much of that is all true. I think that was just fabricated or yeah for the movie right, well, much right. of it artistic was, license long shanks my number four into the threes we go well i hope you don't get too mad about this one but i've oh, always play. thought well <laughs> i'm glad i'm glad I've somebody lined s- me up with three beers here because i'm gonna need them all <laughs> well i generally try to as i listen to the show i like the idea of introducing the viewers the listeners rather excuse me to movies that they haven't maybe even heard of Same. for them to go and check out so Same. here's my one that's way out of left field uh, it's a 1982 comedy directed by actor-director Richard Benjamin. It was called My Favorite Year. And it is... I like you know this that one. Movie? Okay, oh, yeah. great. It is a parody of your show of shows, the Sid Caesar television program from the 50s. And in this one, Mark Lynn Baker plays a young comedy writer who has to chaperone that week's show guest, who is named Alan Swan. He's a parody of Errol Peter Flynn, O'Toole. who was a big drunk and a womanizer, <laughs> just a hellion. And he's played by Peter O'Toole, who got ah. an Oscar nomination for it. But the B story concerns the star of the show, which is called the King Kaiser Hour. And his name is King Kaiser. And he's played by <laughs> Joe Ballone. And it's a fantastic supporting performance because you think, well, we can't have two larger than life egotists in this movie. But you do. Mm-hmm. You've got the Alan Swan character and then you've got this TV character who's just as big. And he, he gets uh, involved with Swan and uh, the a mobster secondary story, which is very funny. At one point, <laughs> this rather blunt, uh, Sid Caesar-esque, uh, larger than life guy tells uh, his other uh, head writer, Leo, about the drunken swan when he shows up for the rehearsal. Plaster, he says, I don't know. Swan is a legend. One of the biggest stars ever. He's one of a kind. We can't get rid of him. That guy is irreplaceable. Replace him, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all this mono mono shit. But it's really sort of about who's the king of that show that week. And, of course... The reigning king is named King Kaiser, so I there you it. go. That's a that's a quality pick. It's it's a nice. very funny movie, so highly recommend it. Yes, my favorite year, good one. Matt, what do you got? Yeah, three? see see the trepidation in in his face when he throws it over to me. Uh, at number three, and I do promise I have some actual monarchs on my list, but I was trying to be creative. Much like Jeff, I want to turn the listeners on to some films they may have missed, and I hope they didn't miss this one. Uh, when you when we do a list of kings, I really think it's only appropriate to put Elvis. On the list, he yes. is. He is the king. Of I course. don't. I have never seen an Elvis movie. Uh, well, this is not an Elvis oh, movie. Okay, but it's going to be about Elvis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is a portrayal of Elvis, of which there are many. Um, who's the guy from Shape of Water? I'm blanking on his name. Who who did the Elvis Nixon movie? Oh, Michael Shannon. Thank you. Michael Shannon did it. Val Kilmer did it in True Romance, which we were talking about earlier. It's great performance. Uh, but I prefer Bruce Campbell in Bubba Hotep. I like this one. Have you seen, I've seen this one? Okay, oh, good. Yeah. I'm, I like so, this one. I'm so relieved. So, uh, what if Elvis switched places with a lookalike in order to, to live an ordinary life, but now regrets it? He finds himself in uh, a nursing home in East <laughs> Texas, uh, befriends a guy named Jack, who's an a elderly black man who thinks he is or may actually be a reincarnation of uh, John F. Kennedy. And if that isn't wacky enough for you, a mummy starts murdering all the people <laughs> living in this uh, nursing home. And trust me, that all sounds like it might not work, but somehow it does. It does. And, it's and a very Bruce, funny movie. Bruce mm-hmm. Campbell carries it. It's phenomenal. Good movie. Yeah. I, I have not thought about that movie in many moons now that you bring it up. Quality. Well, thank you. Yeah. Every once in a while, Matt. I think the Elvis movies, the actual Elvis movies, are kind of trash. Well, it was funny because I thought trying to come up with something with the king, you know, and I couldn't come up with it. I was like, man, I've never seen an Elvis movie. So Jailhouse Rock I've seen. Mm. It's not good. All right, my number three might be the worst movie on my list, but I brought it up because I know we've never really discussed it here on the podcast, and I actually wanted to get your opinion, um, gentlemen, what you thought of this film. 1998, the king in question is Louis the Fourteenth, played by Leonardo DiCaprio mm. in The Man in the Iron Mask. Yes. Um, get Classic. a load of this cast, okay? Gabriel Byrne, Jeremy Irons, John Malkovich, and DiCaprio. Uh, the three of them played the Three Musketeers. 
And in this movie, DiCaprio plays a uh, dual role. So he plays uh, Louis the Fourteenth, who is this sort of ruthless uh, king, again, evil king. Here we go again. And he plays his twin brother, who nobody knows that he had a twin brother, and he casted him away in a jail in an iron mask so that nobody would ever see that he looks identical to the king. Hence the... Uh, musketeers get a hold of this prisoner they come out there's a, a you know a humongous plan to replace the king it's, it's sort of silliness i remember seeing it in the theater and enjoying it at the time but this was during uh the titanic years when dicaprio had like the one and two movie in the theater between this and and titanic and i don't know if i've ever went back and fully watched it i've only probably caught parts of it since then the younger version of me remembers really enjoying this movie, but I don't remember it, um, you know, now to talk about it and say, yes, I recommend it full heartedly. Well, I would also argue that that film, basically uh, the, based on the Dumas story, has been one of the most influential stories in the history of movies. I mean, that is evident in direct satires on that, such as Start the Revolution Without Me, uh, where Gene Wilder and Donald Sutherland play s twins, two sets of them, one pauper, one prince, uh, to everything from things like Freaky Friday and some of those kind of things where you have, you know, different people sort of playing the other person and stuff like that. So it's a very influential story, and that's one of the more s sort of legitimate versions of it that... Uh, was true to the quality original source film, material. You remember it being quality? Um, like in my I mind, don't I, I remember I don't know it why being John good. Malkovich was picked. Like, what <laughs> casting director said, you know who needs to be the third musketeer? That really out of shape, balding, kind of crazy <laughs> guy that is really hard to like. John Malkovich. <laughs> That's no. true. Um, but. Um, I remember liking it as well. Yeah. As, as a kid I in the 90s. I liked everything that Leo did. I still kind of, he's one of my favorites. Same. Yeah, I haven't seen it uh, again recently. So Been a long time, but I thought I'd bring it up. I, yeah. I remember liking it. So that's funny. Yeah, maybe it's time to rewatch it, right? Maybe it is. There All you right. go. That was my number three: the man in the iron mask. Into our two as we go, Jeff. Okay. Um, uh, again, forgive me for this is a little bit looser interpretation of King, but it's one of I would argue maybe the greatest King in movies, other than, you know, if we're going to say Jesus as the King of Kings, though I'm not sure there's been a great Jesus movie, but there is a great great top 10 horror movie of all time made 1933 king kong Ooh. i love i love this pick absolutely love this pick well thank you my friend uh, directed by marion c cooper it's of course the famous story about the giant ape on skull island it's a riff on beauty and a beast in the best way uh and this ape is three stories tall and he falls for a little blonde human named ann darrow played by fay ray the original scream queen and um like I said, uh, this film is generally picked by most critics as one of the top ten horror movies of all time. And it still holds up today, even though it's a stop-motion character and it looks kind of fake and stuff, but it is terrifying. And at the time, I've got a little bit of trivia that I think will interest you. Um, it was a humongous hit. It made $90,000 its first weekend for $0.35 cents a person admission. Wow. That's a ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Um, a lot of ticket sales. A lot of ticket sales. It was a big hit. It saved the studio that made it RKO from bankruptcy so they could go on to make things like Citizen Kane. And it was also one of the grisliest films at the time. And this was before the production code came up in 1934 where they had to, you know, be very careful about language and sex and violence. And this film was so stunningly scary to people and the people were fainting and vomiting and all that kind of stuff. And one scene that <laughs> wow. had to be cut after the test screenings showed four sailors getting eaten by giant spider spiders that had grown men fainting in the aisles. Jesus. And Cooper <laughs> said, well, we probably should cut that one because it's stopping the film cold. Now, just interestingly enough, it's very hard to find the original cut of King Kong today. In fact, that scene has never been replaced to my knowledge. But you can find the one that did go in the theaters, but even that got edited post the code in 34. And oftentimes the ones that's shown on TV or video and stuff like that is not the uncut version. But uh, it was a big hit showing that people even back then loved scary stuff and, and gory stuff. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty shocking movie. Um, and King Kong, as, as scary as he is, isn't the scariest thing on Skull Island. No, no he is not. <laughs> yeah. Good pick at number two, oh, thank Matt. thank you, Fred. Can you follow that up? Uh, honestly, at number two, that's, that's where I had Longshanks. 
And if I had to do an audible and sub one out, I will go with one of my honorable mentions, King Leonidas. Ah, yes. From, from uh, 300. 300. He's, he's a Spartan. This he's, is Sparta. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> probably uh, his best role, right? Yeah. I think he's never really done anything equal to that. And yet they still keep giving him leads in films. They keep trying, but they're they're going more down the Jason Statham, who's actually on the rise, I think. Yes, yes. But uh, he sort of didn't start there after, you know, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. He did a, a string of crap uh, action, and I think that's where uh, our friend uh, Gerard Butler is uh, is headed. Unfortunately, but Leonidas, just a classic, um, strong king who, who actually leads his men and inspires them and, and takes them straight into the, the maw of death. But they follow him willingly. It's that great. was my sixth choice. Uh, I think it's eminently watchable. You know, it and really let's is. face it, Zack Snyder has made a mm-hmm. cottage industry out of the DC movies based on that film. Uh, but True. it's True. really well directed. And it's very compelling. And all of the other actors who are in it, Michael Fassbender is in that. Really? Yes, he's one of the guys. Um, I think he's the guy who cuts the arm off of that emissary uh, in that famous sort of slow motion leap in the air and stuff. And I gotta rewatch it. It's, it's been, been a, while. a long time for me. Yeah. yeah, I've seen it like three or four times. Yeah. But. Uh, at my number two, I continue on being the only person in the room with all kings on my list here, <laughs> actual kings. Um, I go to George the Sixth. Um, this movie came out in 2010, and he was portrayed by none other than Colin Firth in The King's Speech. Academy uh, Award yes. winner I for Best Film and Best Actor. Yes. I knew you would have this. And this is, most people probably know The King's Speech. He has a stuttering problem. Um, and he goes to see a, a, a voice coach played by Jeffrey Rush, who is trying to coach him because this was right at the time where radio was taking over. So this is the first king of England that's actually addressing the nation by radio to the masses, and the damn guy has a stuttering problem. What a son of a gun. What a predicament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he ends up getting this voice coach, and really the relationship between Jeffrey Rush and Colin Firth is what completely makes this movie. It's 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 a touching, enduring uh, relationship, but it's, it's funny. I mean, we always say that we don't award comedies uh, best picture, but in a way, when you look at the King's speech, I'm not saying it's a straight-up comedy like uh, something like Kingpin, but... There's a lot of comedic elements in the King's speech. It's a light drama. Well said. Yeah, and light there drama. is a lot of humor in it, and both of those actors are uh, really well at playing the drama, the heavy stuff, as well as the comedy. What, what in I fact, d- I would argue that Colin Firth really kind of is more of a comedic actor almost because of I would, I would since agree. then. You yes, know, he's I done agree a lot with of that. Lighter what, roles. What, what I don't like is sometimes there's a backlash uh, with movies such as the King's speech where maybe we, oh, we can agree maybe it wasn't the best movie of the year, right? But then... Future people, uh, generations that may not have seen the movie, say, all right, well, I'm not going to see the King's Speech because it shouldn't have won. You know, it starts to get bad name out there. No, just see it for what it is and don't pay attention to, you know, did it win? Didn't it win? What, what, what did it keep from not winning? Yeah, what did it keep from not winning? Throw it in the fish tank. Uh, the Social Network was kind of considered Ooh. to be the one, but that was such a cold film that it was, it was again, nobody cold. really liked anybody in that, where you felt great empathy for the king, and you felt empathy for Jeffrey Rush. They both needed each other to sort of help them because Jeffrey Rush was a failed actor, right. but being a linguist and a, a vocal coach, uh, helped him have worth and him helping the king give the speech I thoroughly gave his it. kingdom worth. So mm-hmm. very well done. I, I agree. I like the pick, right? Here we are. Number ones, guys. Cinema Jaw. Okay, Ray, I don't think you're going to dislike wow. me too much because I'm your guest. Okay. But I think you're going to really <laughs> like this first choice because it ties in with The Lion King. <laughs> I will give you your animated Disney masterpiece there, Matt, but my greatest king of the forest is also from a masterpiece, and that is The Cowardly Lion from The Wizard of Oz. Let's not forget, he was the king of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> now, directed by a host of directors, though the one that's given credit is Victor Fleming, and written by a cadre of screenwriters, up to ten reportedly, wow. it still manages to work brilliantly, even though it's kind of a hodgepodge and they had casting changes and all this. However, Bert Lahr was the first and only choice for The Cowardly Lion, and he gives arguably one of the greatest performances, supporting roles in the history of cinema, maybe the other three, the other two as well. Um, it's the line you remember, though. Yeah, it is the line that you remember most, because he is very funny 
funny. Uh, and that's and so clearly a suit. He's also kind of sad in it. I think at the end when Dorothy leaves, you worry a little bit more about the cowardly lion. Like, is he going to be okay? I think the, the Tin Man and the Scarecrow <laughs> yeah, will be manage, right. but I'm not so sure that, you know, the cowardly lion, because he always has to be talked into everything. It's very you know, codependent. Mm -hmm. Very codependent. I love it. That's so true. Um, Bird Lar was a veteran vaudeville funny man who played it. Uh, he wore a costume that was 90 pounds, a very difficult oh uh, film to make. Um, and he was so beloved a performer that they didn't want to shortchange him with his abbreviated version of If I Only Had the Nerve, because they had gone through the full version with the Scarecrow and the Tim Man before, that they gave him a special number to sing, If I Were King of the Forest, uh, with all great puns and uh, just a slew of them, like bulls kowtowing uh, and thrashing hippos from top to bottom. And my personal favorite... <clears throat> and I'm going to try to do my bird oh, again here for you to end on my f five. I'd command each thing, be it fish or fowl, will woof and a ruff and a royal growl. Woof. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Well done. The king <laughs> of the forest, the true lion king. That's hey, a good one. If, that was an honorable mention of mine. If John Favreau remakes this one, man, I'm going <laughs> to send him your number right there. I can do the cross eyed too. You never know what you're going to get here on <laughs> Cinema Jaw. I love it. It's great. <laughs> Matt, Matt, are you going to sing on your number one? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, I couldn't top that. Uh, but I do have an actual king. I love it. At my number one. And I, it, listen, when you say movie king or fictional king uh, or legendary king. Right. This, I think, is the one that pops into everybody's mind. Like, traditional crown, shield, sword, mm. King Arthur. Yep, one of the greats. I mean, in what movie, though? And in what, film. What, what version of film? Here? Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> 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 the satire of it. Uh, Not Excalibur, no. Uh, I loved Excalibur. <laughs> Excalibur is also pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's the one with, um, uh, oh my God. First Night. Not w First Night. That's an awful one. With Richard Disney Gere? Sword yeah, in the Stone? with Richard Gere. Well, anyway, there's yeah. been so many King Arthurs, yes. right? There's a Disney animated classic, right. The Sword in the Stone. Yes. Richard Harris in the musical of Camelot. Mm -hmm. Right. I Take your pick. For me, I'm going with Monty Python. So infinitely quotable. The Black Knight scene alone. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, if the whole movie was just that one scene, <laughs> it'd be okay. Good one. It's about a flesh wound. Yeah. It's just a flesh wound. It's just a mere flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. My number one, also a king, and I think a damn good king, but he doesn't really uh, get his throne, his moment, until uh, the end of an entire series. I'm, I'm looking all the way to Middle Earth, Matt. Okay. All right? Oh, yes. yes. You went rings. so traditional here. The return of the king. For Ar Aragorn. Yes. Yep. yep. And king of Men. Yes, King of Men, the 35th King of Gondor, if you want to be precise here, mm. Matt. Wow. And <laughs> you really did your research, Ryan. He is also uh, the King of the, the Dead, right? He comes and he That's gets the, right. the, the army of the dead to come uh, fight for him. Yeah. Uh, so great. And you don't really see him actually get his crown until the final moments of, what's the name of the third film? Return of the King. Return of the King. They're appropriate. It's right in the title. Right. So you don't see it until that third uh, film where he's actually got a crown on, and he talks to the, the hobbits, hobbits. Yeah. And, he, and he says, you know, you guys bow to no one. What a great moment. What a great king oh. he is he already. Is. He is. Generous and... Not too egotistical. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, his humble beginnings is Strider, the That's ranger right. That's who right. sat and smoked a pipe in the shadowy corners of a tavern. He remembers That's that. That's right. You know, he remembers where he came from. I could be wrong on this. You can throw this in the fish tank as well, but I think that is actually the longest title of a best picture. Mm, throw it in there. Because it's the Lord of the Rings... The Return the of the King. The Return of the King. I think the only other one that could give it a run for the money is Doctor Strange Love, which is technically entitled Doctor Strange Love or... How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the right. Bomb. That might be longer. But I don't think longer. that one, that, did that win? Oh, that's right. It didn't win Best it Picture. It didn't win. You're right. So it is easily right. the longest winning Best Picture winner. Best Picture winner. Right. Maybe Strange Love is the longest nominated, nominated. Best Film. Yeah. Uh, honorable mentions before we go to break. I had Leonidas. You got any? Uh, I went with The King. We just talked about this movie um, in Gladiator, who was played by... Joaquin Crow. Phoenix. Oh, Joaquin Phoenix. He was the emperor. emperor. Right. right. Yes. But it, no, he's like the king, the emperor. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 The, the head right. of state. Yeah. Um, how about Thor? Not a king. He's a prince. Odin is king. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Odin. Oh, Odin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those are very good choices. Uh, the outlaw king, which was a continuation of the Braveheart story that talked about Robert the Bruce. This is a Netflix film. 
Chris Pine plays the Outlaw King. Mm-hmm. Any good? Worth a spin. If, okay. you're, if you're a fan of Braveheart, I think it's worth a spin. And the last one, this is not the greatest film by any means. Whenever you get a, a movie directed by Madonna, probably not the best. <laughs> well, but I don't know. She directed a movie called W.E., right? which was actually about... Um, Edward, who was the guy who actually gave up the crown That's so that right. um, George, could George the VI, yeah. who was the stuttering king, right. could become the king. But he gave up the crown for, um, what was her name, Wallace? Yeah, Mrs. Simpson to yeah. marry a woman who was a divorcee. Right, which was totally scandalous. And to see that sort of backstory, I enjoyed the film just to get that history lesson of it all. I mean... I got, I got one. Stephen King, it's a big stretch, and oh, I know Ryan fun. hates that. But yeah, and, and we, big stretch. <laughs> we, gave, we gave Stephen King his due here on Cinema Job recently yeah. with an entire month. But. All right. If we missed your favorite King, and I mean King, <laughs> and you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at Cinema Jaw, or you can email us feedback at cinemajaw.com. What we're going to do is take a break. When we come back, Matt is taking Jeff on in. John Farvra movie trivia, plus a cinema war looking at Quentin Tarantino's best character. Stick with us. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's In honor of Cinema Jaws Quentin Tarantino lobby. Month, we celebrate Let's where this clip, where Vernita Green should have been the Black Mamba. The day after tomorrow, how about tonight, bitch? Splendid. Where? There's a baseball diamond where I coach our little league about a mile from here. We meet there around 2.30 in the morning, dressed all in black. Your hair in a black stocking. And we have us a knife fight. We won't be bothered. Now, (laughs) I have to fix Nikki's cereal. Bill always said you were one of the best ladies he ever saw with an edge weapon. Fuck you, bitch. I know he didn't qualify that shit. So you can just kiss my motherfucking ass, Black Mamba. Black Mamba. I should have been motherfucking Black Mamba. To get ourselves a treat. I was adored by thousands of right-wing Pennsylvanians before I got shot, including Jack Black. Starring alongside Robin Williams when he had a mustache made it difficult to keep a straight face on set, I imagine. I was a good person who didn't make a lot of sense when Sean Penn pinned a crime on me. I've been a Viking, a prisoner, a ball player, and a buddy to Martin. Who am I? If you know the answer to the July riddle, write us feedback at cinemajot.com. You can take Matt on in trivia or win yourself a prize pack. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Jeff York. Uh, Jeff, again, for the jawheads that want to check out your artwork first, best place to do so is? JeffYorkCaricatures.com. And for the reviews? CreativeScreenwriting.com or TheEstablishingShot.blogspot.com. Do it, jawheads. Matt, before we get to trivia and before we get to cinema war, we did throw a few items into the fish tank. And the king of the fish tank, Phil me and Phil, wants to <laughs> swim up to the top and show us his crown. Thanks, Open Phil. Open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish. Isn't it? DC, wake up, wake up. It's an old pad. It's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a second message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Wow, thank you guys. I've never been called a king. I've never even been called a prince before, so this is great. You got your uh, trident and your... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing a shirt? Yeah, it's great. Uh, before, we have a, a couple of questions in here. I did want to ask real quick, because it is, it's the Lion King week. Um, are you guys familiar with Kimba, the white lion? No. Fill me in, Phil. Well, because the reason I bring it up is when you guys were talking about influences, uh, I thought maybe somebody would. There, um, I, I forget. I forget the gentleman's name. Um, Throw it in the I'm fish a tank. Fan. I, <laughs> I, I should. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the uh, the the guy who made Astro Boy, he also had a different a different manga series called Kimba the White Lion, which is uh, 
very like suspiciously close to the lion king and mm. it came out in like i want to say like the 60s or 70s or something it rhymes um, with simba too yeah 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 yeah. well it's it's like super like almost beat for beat the lion king wow. he's like the king of the jungle um i was wondering I, I just always think uh it's such like a curious thing and a lot of people don't know about it but no oh. well done phil i'm glad look, you brought it up look it well, up talk about it's, investigation work uh, we do got a couple of questions in the box, so let's start off. Uh, the first one I have, what was, when was the last time that Jeff was on the show? Uh, so the last episode he was on was episode 386, uh, when we talked about Three Identical Strangers and Black Klansmen, and that was in August of last year. Wow, so it has been just about a year. Almost wow. exactly. P- pretty there close. Yeah. What are the run times for both Lion King films? So the original film was 88 minutes. Just over or just under an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, the new one is 118 minutes, so they added an entire half an hour of extra content to this one. Wow. It's funny; it doesn't feel like it. No, I agree. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a long movie, but generally Disney animated films it, were shorter. If I, mean, if I was going short. to say, Pixar I mean, now goes to two hours, but yeah. at that time, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, they were right probably at the under 90 minute, minute mark. Yeah. I was going to say, if anywhere where I felt that this was a, a little long was actually in the beginning of the film, as I mentioned. It's, it took a little while to get going. It was a little slow at that point. Hmm. Uh, our next one, when did Crouching, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon come out in relationship to Anna and the King? Uh, so Anna and the King was 1999. Uh, and then, Ryan, wow. you were correct in saying that exactly a year later, uh, Hidden Dragon came out. Mm. So one year apart. Great movie, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Terrific. Fantastic. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what did the what were the other films that the King's Speech beat at the Oscars in 2011? So it, it actually went up against a lot of heavy hitters. Wow. It Black was a, Swan. Yes, Black Swan, Ooh. The Fighter, True Inception, Grit. True oh. Grit, The Kids Are All Right, 127 Hours, uh, The Social Network, as was mentioned, Winter's Bone, and Toy Story 3. Wow. I, picked, I honestly would have picked any one of those. <laughs> Any one of those over the King's Speech. I'm a big Black Swan fan. I, I am love too. That I way back and watched oh, it and I'm like, oh, I'm it's watching fantastic. a masterpiece. Yeah, it's it is. So it really good. is. And yeah. Inception. I love Inception. I'm not as hot on Inception. So I, you're right. I, I would probably put, and that's what I'm talking about, the backlash of the King's Speech. Don't, don't put it in those terms because then we're, we're mad at the movie for some reason. It's a quality movie also. It is. But yeah, I agree. Those are some But that's some a good lot of good movies for one year. Wow, the Academy really had it right there. That was a lot of good ones yeah. nominated. Uh, I'm kind of right, I guess. Um, and then the last one is The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, the longest title of a Best Picture winner. So I, I actually I had to do some math here, which oh, is no. not my strong suit, <laughs> oh, but no. I did double and triple check this, and I, I, I believe my math is correct. As it is, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King is 32 letters and 10 syllables long, and it is the second longest title. It was the longest until 2014 when Birdman came out and oh, has the lesser right. known title yes. Birdman or, or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. Right. Which right. is 39 letters Dang. and 14 well syllables. Done, well done, Well done. No, that is well done. That but may be the best fish tank of all time. That's it's so only, good. Uh, and it's, it's hard. I would never have known that because it's always just been Birdman. Mm-hmm. But that's the fantastic. official title. Yes, that's mm-hmm. right. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah, that's why we throw things into the fish tank. He gets it right. Was that everything, Phil? That is all we got. All right, jump back in there, King. Will do. Thank you. (laughs) Matt, it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. The war, it works like this. Me and Matt, were fighting on a topic. Jeff York, our guest, is playing judge and jury. Oh, no. He tells the jawheads who won this cinema war. Oh, no. And it's very... Very important because we're fighting for jaw time to rent and rave on whatever the hell we want. We're talking Quentin Tarantino characters here, Phil. Tell the jawheads at home what today's Cinema War topic is. Yes, who is the best Quentin Tarantino character of all time? Jules from Pulp Fiction or Hans Landa from Inglorious Bastards? Ryan, you've got Hans, and Matt, you have Jules. Let this Cinema War begin. Hans Landa, played by Christoph Waltz, is by far the best Tarantino has given us. There is a maturity to this character that a young Tarantino would not have been able to write up earlier in his career. He is patient on screen, confident, and terrifying. His nickname, the Jew Hunter, still makes me squirm. 
At the end of each movie, Jules wins and Hans loses. Jules ain't exactly a hero, per se, Rye, but he emerges victorious nonetheless and winds up being the philosophical soul of the movie. All things poignant about Pulp Fiction are Jules. Jules goes around shooting unarmed college kids. <laughs> wow, that's great, Matt. <laughs> Truth be told, Pulp Fiction has a lot going for it. Career performances from Travolta and Uma Thurman, multiple storylines, the list goes on. In Glorious Bastards, however, while equally great, is very heavily reliant on the character of Hans Landa. The movie, as great as it is, is nothing without him. That is a bingo. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you brought this up. Let's talk about memorable dialogue here. Sam Jackson is giving more quotes per second in that movie than any film previously, save maybe The Holy Grail, which we talked about earlier. He's the bad mother What ain't no country you ever heard of? You should be on brain de detail. I could go on and on. He's got like 18 Check million quotes. Check out the big brain on hey. Brad. Well, well, both characters are a mar Marvel on screen. You have to say Hans is the more complicated one. He seems so evil one minute, the next minute well-mannered officer. He's willing to change sides in an instant, yet does evil things against the Jews. He speaks four languages, which comes up in the plot of the film in... He enjoys a good strudel. I don't know. <laughs> Jules, Jules is really complex, Ryan. I mean, he's, he's quoting the Bible and stuff. And, and tell me, what does Marcellus Wallace look like, Ryan? It's that monologue. It's one of the best movie scenes of all time. Full stop. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger if you disagree. All right, both these, <laughs> both these roles launched the careers of these actors. However, Samuel L. Jackson was already becoming a name. Christoph Waltz was a complete unknown to American audiences. And with this and another Tarantino film, he has two Oscars on his mantle. Again, you watch Pulp Fiction, you walk away talking about a lot of things. You watch Inglorious Bastards, and everyone comes out talking about Hans Landa. Royale with cheese. Hans is great, but he's no Jules Ryan. There's one of these characters painted in grand fashion, 20 feet tall on the Sistine Chapel-like ceiling at the AMC where we went today to watch The Lion King. Just one of them, and it's Jules. We are buttonheads here on Cinema War as we do each and every week. Not every week, but quite a bit. Well, most weeks. We throw it to our guest, our jury. Jeff, what did you think of this Cinema War? Well, I loved it. Uh, I love both of those characters. Uh, I, I really enjoy Tarantino movies. Those are my two favorite movies of his, two of the greatest performances. Um, and while I really love Inglorious Bastards and Mr. Landa, I'm going to give the slight edge to Jules, yes. and here's, here's oh, why. This I'm terrible. sorry. No, no, no. Listen, I mean, this could me. be the worst week of cinema job. <laughs> oh, no. oh. For you, for oh. all the rest of us, is awesome. <laughs> Ryan is laughing, folks. Uh, he's really not hurt, I don't think. I, and here's what I'm going to tell you why. Uh, both of you make really good arguments, but I think by the nature of Pulp Fiction having time on its side, that helps it a little bit more. Because I think, A, it, na it made Tarantino's career. That sure is the did. one that is constantly quoted. It's probably his most famous character of all of them. And because it was 94 versus, you know, a, f a couple years ago, uh, I think it benefits from that. Um, I would also argue, uh, the one thing I would disagree with you right on is, I think Jules is the main character in Pulp Fiction. He has uh, the big set piece at the beginning. It's extraordinary that he was, Samuel Jackson was placed in the supporting actor category and Travolta was placed in the lead. Now, he did have the extra part with Uma Thurman, but Samuel Jackson dominates the first part. He dominates the middle part when, uh, when they have to clean up the, 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 car. the car and everything. Yeah. And he certainly dominates the hold up at the end with Tim Roth. He's also one of the um, few that actually has a character arc. Yes. And he, yeah, because he does not choose to kill when he could have easily. Um, I'll give it to that because that, but I think if you're talking about a very close second, it is Hans Land. And I mm. think to, to your point about Tarantino writing that, without Christoph Waltz, he probably couldn't have pulled it off because it's such a very elaborate, specific character. But I think time gives the one that's been around longer a little bit weight in the final Matt, judgment. Sorry. That earns you, <laughs> believe it or not. 
a little jaw time to rent and rave on whatever you got. Uh, no. Okay, I got one. Uh, I actually <laughs> caught a documentary uh, that, that came out last year. It's on Netflix currently. This guy is doing sort of the rounds. He was just on Larry King, uh, and he was just on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. And the, the movie's a little out there, man, but I really just enjoyed it. It's, about, it's called Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. Oh, and wow. That, that title should turn off a lot of people, but I urge you just to, to, to sit down and give it a chance. I'm not telling you what to believe, but this story is, is fascinating. The documentary is very compelling, and, uh, you know, like I said, he was on some, some credible talk shows. I mean, Larry King doesn't just have on any crackpot. The filmmaker does put on... Larry King's still going with us? He's still He's around, still with yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the filmmaker, not the Bob Lazar character, he, he does take a little bit too many liberties uh, stylistically. Mickey Rourke does this unnecessary voiceover. But when it gets down to the court story of this person, Bob Lazar, who's a whistleblower who worked at Area 51, which is, the, the, these are facts. He actually did. Uh, it's fascinating. Hmm. Fascinating. There check it go. out. Can Netflix. we check it out on Netflix? It's, on, it's streaming now. So I, I All right. ask you to check it out. All right. Brings us to trivia. Last segment. Ryan Jeff. is so sour. <laughs> Look at him. He's just I, he's I feel defeated. like I ruined your night, Ryan. I Jeff, know, you're I'm so guest. sorry. <laughs> you get to choose if you're you want so to close. You want to, you get to choose if you want to go first or let Mac K go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any questions, you get one trip to the king. Fill me in, Phil. He'll help you out. Um, I'll be a gentleman and let Matt go first. All right. They do start out easy. Should have told you that. Oh well. Thanks or should have I? Hmm. Maybe he would have if I hadn't yeah. picked Matt <laughs> over. The... All right. Question number one in John Favre movie trivia. In 2014, John starred in this movie where he loses his job at a restaurant and buys a food truck. Chef. One to nothing. Matt, question two over to Jeff. He wrote it as well, I believe. I believe you're wrong. Phil's giving me a thumbs up. Late, late fish tank. <laughs> question two over to Jeff. In 2003, John directed the holiday classic Elf. What actor starred his buddy, the Elf? Will Ferrell. All right, we got the easy ones out of the way. All right. <laughs> question three over to Matt. Matt, in 2011, John directed a box office dud which was shocking considering it starred Daniel Craig and Harrison Ford named the film. Wow. Oh, Cowboys versus Aliens. We'll give it to him. We'll Is give it, it to Aliens him. versus Cowboys? Cowboys, Cowboys and, aliens. and Aliens. No okay. verse. But no that's, verse. That's close. You gave him the nod, I noticed. You sort of said, okay, it's close yeah, enough. Yeah. yeah. All right. Close enough. Two to one, Matt. Question four over to <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, what actor played War Machine in the first Iron Man movie, a film John directed. That was Terrence Howard. Thought somebody might have forgot that. Terrence Howard. He wanted too much money for the sequel, so mm. they recast. Do you think he's still kicking himself over that one? Probably, because he would have made a lot of money. Right. Question five, back over to Matt. Everybody perfect here, two to two. Matt, question five. In 2009, John Favreau appeared in this comedy starring Paul Rudd and Jason Siegel, in which Paul Rudd looks for a new best friend. Oh, um, I love you, man. Three to two. Matt, question six. Back over to Jeff. you got to stick with him here. In 2004, John appears in the film Wimbledon, which was about two tennis players falling in love. The actor was Paul Bettany, Name the actress in the film. Kirsten Dunst. These guys are on fire. I don't think I would have gotten that one, dude. <laughs> three to three. Everybody perfect after six questions. So it's down to the final two, Ooh. and no one has used the lifeline. Wow. Question seven to you, Matt K. Matt, John Favreau has appeared in two movies with Keanu Reeves. One was The Replacements. The other was this 2003 romantic comedy that also starred Diane Keaton. Well, I might as well jump in the fish tank. Wow! Into the fish King, tank we go. King, fill me in, Phil. Phil, what was the name of that John Favreau, Keanu Reeves, Diane Keaton romantic comedy? All righty, Matt. Your clue this week? This clue has got to give you what you need. Oh, man. 
got to give you what you need. I got the need for speed, as in we don't have much time. <laughs> I mean, I was going to guess like parenthood, but I know obviously that has nothing to do with giving you what you need. I mean, this There's is a big ball like game though here. This is a big ball game here. Hmm. I know that's another clue. Something like that. S something you need. I don't know. I really don't know. Sorry, Jeff, you probably Jeff, win. Jeff, a chance for the steal and to take the lead. Diane Keaton got an Oscar nomination for Best Actress for it. It was entitled, Something's Gotta Give. Jack Nicholson was also in a romantic I've seen it, yeah. That's... Foil in it, yeah. Wow. Big, big change here. It is now 4-3. to three. Jeff, and the last question of the game is to him so he can win it on a walk-off. Oh, wow. Still a chance for, for technically for Matt to, to tie it up. Last question to you, Jeff. The last movie John Favreau did with Vince Vaughn was this 2009 comedy that also starred Jason Bateman. Name the movie. Um, They've starred in many yes, films together, the but the where, last one they starred together. Um, Couples Retreat. Oof. Wow. 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 Absolutely perfect. <laughs> Five to three. Didn't, Jeff wins this didn't one. Didn't even use his life. Did line. not at all. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Can I get a handshake yeah. between oh, you guys? Thank you. Well done. Uh, if it came down to a tie, we call it a jawbreaker. This question would have been over to Matt. Oh. Matt, what one movie is John Favreau known for? If you had to say it was one movie, mm -hmm. directing Iron Man or starring in Swingers? That's a trick question. It's it's the Lion King remake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Real jawbreaker was this. Age of Vince Vaughn. Closest to. Uh, he's, he's a little older than me, but maybe not quite a full decade older than me. But maybe. I'll just say 50. Lock him in at 50. Jeff, do you got a guess? 49. That's probably... Jeff nailed it. 49. 49. Damn it. That's exactly what I was going to say. I gave him the big 5-0. Awesome. Well done there. Jeff wins this one and hits it on the head. Yeah. Hey, Whew. happy birthday, Vince Vaughn. Big 5-0 yeah. this year, I guess. Huh? Good stuff. Wow. This has been a blast. It has been. I came around. I got a little slump there after I lost my cinema war. Yeah, it's okay, man. <laughs> Had my rant ready to go. It was hey, really you, close. It was really close. Yeah. You got uh, you got like 10 in a row not too long I know. ago. This is true. This so, is true. You've had your chance. Brings us to the end of a great job. First and foremost, we got to thank Jeff for coming back on. This is always a pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, for sure. Also got to thank our engineer, the guy over there inside the booth, Phil and Phil. Thank you guys so much. Great to be back after the holiday. Love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're back. We are. Got to thank our sponsors, too, yes, Matt. Yes, thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op, who help us get cool sponsors like them. Hey, the easiest way to support this show is leave us a review wherever you are listening to this podcast. And while you're there, click subscribe. One extra button helps us out quite a bit. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on John about, about the, the movies. movies.